Hi, Marissa. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? I can't complain. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is the right show available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Marissa Baradaran, a professor of law at the University of California, Irvine. Um, and, and this is of some relevance to the conversation we're going to have, I think, and associate dean for equity, diversion, and inclusion mm-hmm. uh, at the law school there. Uh, you're the author of a couple of books, both published by Harvard University Press. Mm-hmm. Uh, most recently, I think, The Color of Money, Black Banks, and the Racial Wealth Gap. Uh, before that, How the Other Half Banks, Exclusion, Exploitation, and the Threat to Democracy. Mm-hmm. So what we're going to talk about is critical race theory. And the way the conversation came about is that we were talking on Twitter, and two things became apparent to me. Actually, one of them was already apparent, which is that I don't know anything about critical race theory. That was already apparent to me. The, the thing that uh, became newly apparent to me was that you actually know something about it. And so I thought we could have a conversation uh, where you explain it to me and uh, answer some frequently asked questions uh, about what it means, how it's being deployed, what some misunderstandings of it may be, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um I don't expect this to be like a big argument. I'm just trying to learn. I may play devil's advocate sometimes. Sure. Sure. Uh, but so I guess the obvious question to start with is yeah. what is critical race theory? Yeah. Uh, be- yeah. Before I answer that, let me just uh, start a little bit before, um, you know, how it started. I mean, I uh, ha- have been a fan of all of your books um, for <laughs> years and years, I've read everything. And I saw, I didn't realize that there was, you know, you, you had a newsletter, and I just went down this, you know, rabbit hole of reading everything. And I was just like, this is so great. And you were on the right side of some of the controversial things, or my side, I should say, <laughs> of some of these things. And I'm so sure. Well, if it's the side I was on, I'm sure it is the right <laughs> exactly. side. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so critical race theory. So there was what I understood, I mean, I'm going to be very generous to the way that I think it, it's talked about now, uh, but the way I understood um, in law school critical race theory, that was the context that we all um, sort of were brought up. And it, it wasn't a big part of my law school training. I graduated in 2005, um, but it was uh, a legal um, uh, critical theory uh, among several um, where you would a- and analyze a case or a body of law through the lens of race. And, and I, want, I want to be clear here, it, this is not something that we did a lot of in law school. And in fact, it was very frustrating sometimes because you would be in a contracts or torts or property class and there would be these like very um, you know, abstract concepts of, of property law or you know, lock-in principles or you know, law and economics or whatever. And sometimes you, know, uh, you wanted, you, well, what is the, what is the, uh, the race, what are the races of these two people? You know, like, are there... Are there, is there a historical context that you want to see? There's also feminist theory, right? There was class, class crit. You know, there's a lot of crit um, uh, things in, in law school. And, and critical race theory, um, we had one professor who was actually a critical race theorist, Derek Bell. He was, you know, an older um, academic. And, and he was sort of the purveyor of, now, of the concept. Now, he, uh, just to say a little about his story, he had been at Harvard Law School, right? Mm-hmm. And then, um, and he was teaching a course that kind of was critical uh, race um, theory. Now, so, this is decades ago, of yeah, course. Yeah. And and then he there was some controversy. He left Harvard and uh, students wanted there to be a black professor who would teach the course he had vacated and the administration mm-hmm. didn't comply or something. There was a whole thing. But he is one of the founding people. Right. Of CRT. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the way um, the way that the history of the movement goes is that uh, after Derek Bell, Derek Bell protested that there weren't, you know, uh, uh, they hadn't uh, given tenure to uh, uh, a professor who he thought that should have gotten tenure and a person of color. And um, he left, you know, and uh, Kim, Kimberly Crenshaw was a student of his. And I think she kind of inaugurated um, the theory. It was a few, you know, uh, academics around that time. And, and, you know, I've read all of their, their books to, to, to start with. And, and they said exactly this thing, like we were um, sort of in these classes and felt like the, the analysis of law at the time just didn't, didn't even consider issues of race. And we wanted to add that not as a, like to, to take over the theory, but just like, Hey, here's another way to look at 
cases that might come up. Um, and, and so that's, that was critical race theory. Um, it, and it wasn't, it's not, it has not been like a, a popular or over, overwhelming theory in law. I would say that like law and economics or um, other theories are, were much more prevalent um, and, and, and impactful in the, in the creation of law. Now, is it uh, related to critical legal studies, which yes. was not about race per se, but I gather did include the idea that law is kind of sometimes used by the well the ruling class to exploit the the other classes kind of i mean it's kind of a kind of a leftist kind of vaguely you might say mm-hmm. marxist uh theory and, but but it was not about race per se in it in its most mm-hmm. generic form right and it preceded critical race yes. theory yes yes it was based on so critical race theory T- uh, took from critical legal theory and, and spun off into the into the race uh, okay. theory, and, and it was very much a, a scholarly treatise. It was not meant to. It was like you wouldn't weren't going to uh, learn property law through critical race theory, but it was a lens of scholarship by which you would uh, look at law, right? And 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 it's look, you know, any legal interpretation has some theory within it, right? You go in, you know, you have Scalia's originalism. You have, um, you know, the Federalist Societies, you know, I- ideas of, you know, textualism, originalism. You've got law and economics saying it's just about efficiency. You have the legal realists before that. So this is Justice Holmes and others to say, look, the law is, you know, practical and it's outcome driven and judges sometimes get there. And so I teach, you know, contracts and property and 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 you have to come up with a reason. You've got these two equally valid claims and the, the tricky cases, the, the place where legal scholarship comes into place to say, how do we balance these uh, claims mm-hmm. to, you know, a piece of property and what theory are we going to use um, uh, to go between? And, and critical race theorists are saying, look, there, are, there is, you should consider race in how we develop these, mm-hmm. these things. Mm-hmm. And, and can I ask one question about, about legal realism, which you alluded to? I mean, mm-hmm. with it, we're going back even before yeah. um, mm-hmm. critical legal studies. Mm-hmm. And I gather it is the idea, which to me now seems kind of commonsensical, but apparently a hundred years ago was kind of radical, mm-hmm. which is that, you know, judges are human beings. Yes. They have, they are not these completely objective arbiters who are guided by uh, rules in this kind of algorithmic way. And so the, the output of their judgments is inevitable given precedent and so on. But on the contrary, they are people, they have, uh, interest groups are associated with, uh, and as a result, rulings get political, uh, and, 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 um, uh, sometimes maybe even without the judges realizing it or meaning it. Yeah. But, uh, you can see how given that, then, then critical legal theory could make sense. Critical legal theory is in a certain sense, an application of legal realism. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and then, uh, CRT is in a, in a, in a certain sense, a more specific application of, well, yes. maybe that's not quite right, but in a way of yeah. critical legal theory uh, uh, yeah. studies. Yes. I mean, you can go back to natural law. I mean, the natural law was before legal realism, which is there is a law out there that is like God given rights or whatever. And you would have to like determine it. It's like some scientifically based thing fact out there in the universe. And just like you would look at the laws of gravity, you would find the natural law and legal realists were like, well, hold up, you know, like there's, uh, you know, maybe, but maybe it's, you know, uh, uh, we we design society the way that it's convenient. And these judges, like you can't just, you know, uh, Johnson versus McIntosh is the case I teach early on in property, which is the, the taking of Native American land. And they're like, well, do the Native Americans have title to sell their land? Or do they not? And there's, you know, locking in natural law theory being used here in a very legal, realistic way to say, look, we can't build this country if natives have the right to sell, because if they have the right to sell, they have the right not to sell. And they if they don't sell, then there's all of this. And, land. You know, so in this case was when 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 was this Johnson decided? versus McIntosh? So this is 18. Um, is John Marshall, 1836 or something like that. Um so and if, so, so legal realism would have allowed you to look at that case and argue that this wasn't some kind of inevitable logical outcome. It was like white guys <laughs> saying we want this land. It was like right? a necessity. Yeah, it was a necessity, a political necessity for you know manifest destiny to happen. And so, right. and 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 it really gets to the basis of like, well, the the law. Uh, they were searching for reasons for this, you know, um, and, and natural law, they actually use the Lockean principle. Like, look, they're not using the land. 
And that means that it's not property. So they can't have property. And what use is, is a very deterministic, you know, Puritan use is you, you have to cull and till and, and to cut down the trees. And, and we are doing that. So that's real property rights. Mm-hmm. And what they're doing with it right now is not, and you know, th- these were not like, you know, these tribes that were like nomadic. These were, you know, the, 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 the nations um, were, coming to court with, with documents saying, look, you know, mm-hmm. we actually have very clear use standards and we we have these legal documents that these are your your courts. Anyway, so so it's a pretty um, brute power decision. Um, and John Marshall actually makes several of those decisions in a course of you know several years and, and really permits the complete, you know, uh, taking of, uh, of of Native American lands. Um, uh, uh, Claudio Sant is a historian at UGA, wrote this great book. I think he won one of the polls or something um, called Unworthy Republic, where it just kind of tracks that whole legal history. So that's a, that's a legal realistic thing. And so I think the critical race theorists would say, well, did this, could we bring in views of, you know, savagery and Native American, you know, um, humanity here to understand how this law developed? And I think of course you could, you know, it's, it's clear, clear as day in those, um, in that legal doctrine, how has that developed over time? And, and I think that's one way, I think you would look at the progression of law. Can I throw a curveball at you that just occurred to me this very moment? Could you make, could somebody who opposes Roe versus Wade make a kind of comparable argument? In other words, the Roe versus Wade rests on this idea that there is in the constitution a uh, uh, protection of privacy. Well, it's not explicit. I mean, these justices had to kind of say that. It, yeah. And and so there seems to have been a little creativity involved. And you could argue that this was a case of people who held a particular view on the abortion issue using their judicial power to, uh, you know, to legislate. And, and that was no more inevitable an outcome on logical grounds than the case you just cited. Absolutely. You know, and I think there's a there's a great new book by a colleague, Jamal Greens at Yale, a law professor uh, called When How Rights Went Wrong. And he talks exactly about this. Like there was no there's no concept in the or the, the, the way that the American Supreme Court has interpreted these rights of uh, uh, privacy, uh, free speech are these like abstract but very binary. Um, you either have it or you don't. And if you have it, it's you, you. It's it's a really strong concept of right. Whereas you know he, he talks about the the um, European concept of like you balance things out, right? And so in abortion rights, I think we did go down this very narrow perception of it's either all or nothing, right? And so I think th- th- it did not need to be that way, right? It could be that well, you have rights to, you know, a choice and autonomy until a certain point. And then, you know, and we're balancing different needs of society. And clearly we have to balance the fetus's rights also, right? We have to balance those things and the woman's right. And let's just, you know, same with gun rights, same with First First um, Amendment rights, right? We have a very um, binary perception. So you have it or you don't. And things like, you know, school um uh, uh, access resources. There were s- several cases in the development during that same era of abortion and, and uh, gun rights where people came to, we have a right to schools that are, you know, well supplied. Um, and it was, um, uh, some, uh, uh, sort of Mexican American communities and black communities saying, look, our schools are, are, um, have no, um, sort of running water. They're, they're cold. Mm-hmm. They're falling apart. And so we have, the students have a right. And the court said, no, you don't have a right to, to this. This is not a constitutionally protected right. And, you know, if, if we hadn't had such a narrow concept, we could have said, well, you know, you, you should have some some sort of equal measures that the law mm-hmm. protects. Right. Um, yeah. but instead, now, we went down a. Yeah. Like a, so, just so a schools are an interesting example, because I gather I mean, we've been we've been speaking in a kind of legal like jurisprudential context but i gather i mean based on my having spent a few minutes looking at wikipedia's critical uh, race theory entry at least i gather that you know the idea of crt is applied beyond uh the law per se and the argument is that in a lot of ways our institutions not just legal institutions but our institutions are set up in ways that lead to racial discrimination and racial disparity uh, without that being an explicit and without it being an explicit rationale and maybe without it even being consciously uh, intended. But 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 one one place, you know, you see an intersection between the legal institutions and other institutions 
is schools, I think, because, you know, schools are, are mm-hmm. their institutions and the way they're set up. And in America, uh, the um, uh, schools are heavily funded by local property taxes. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I think, you know, I went to high school in San Antonio and I believe there was a Supreme Court case about San Antonio schools because San Antonio yes, has there a is. ton yes. of different school districts. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I was in a school district that consisted of four high schools and the whole city had maybe 20, 30 or something high schools. And there was like mm-hmm. seven or eight districts or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so you naturally, given mm-hmm. the reliance on local property taxes, if you if you, car, you know, if the districts are kind of carved up like that, you're going to have great disparities Mm -hmm. in educational Mm -hmm. resources. Um, So that I I assume CRT would say, look, that right there is an institutional form of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And then that comes before the courts and it Mm -hmm. passed muster. Apparently. I mean, I mean, the the system Mm -hmm. is still there, right? San Antonio has not changed. Yes, yes, yes. Well, th- so, so I, I actually want to pivot maybe to what people think CRT is as opposed to what, because CRT actually wouldn't um, be a legal argument that you would make in court. It's not like that. It's like a theory that scholars right. use to kind of like problematize the, the current concept. It's not a legal argument. Um, so, um, so, so I, neither is law and economics. These are just theories through which, you know, a court can kind of look at the whole a variety of things. But I think when we talk about CRT now, I think it's, well, and it doesn't make sense to be like, well, this is what it meant before, because I think the, the meaning has migrated over to this public space where I think now it's it's come to, well, what, are, what is a curriculum? How are you teaching the ch- children in schools about race and racism and, and things like that? And, and, and we can pivot there. I want to say quickly as a bridge between the two is that the, the school concept is, I, I'm, I'm actually not a CRT scholar. I, uh, that's not my mode of analysis, but I think there's a, there's a place to say, look, the reason why schools are funded by local taxes, the reason why there are these disparities is that we had for a long time baked explicitly race into law. Right. So we created these FHA, you know, um, uh, segregated suburbs um, uh, through the New Deal and racial covenants that, you know, like as a person who studies uh, property were were really quite explicit. Every single contract had you shall not sell this house to Mm -hmm. someone not of the Caucasian descent. And these were litigated. And that's how like the mythology of race is created in America as people who looked like me would come to court and be like, well, we're technically Caucasian because look at the Caucasus Mountains and and, you know, we're not quite Arabs, you know, and so the courts had to deal with this. Right. Well, what does it mean? to Are you an Arab? Are you an Indian? You know, and there's a whole body of law where a court had to be like, well, is this person Caucasian or not? So Asian, you know, and, and they would go all over the place. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But 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 the basis was in these legal contracts that were very enforceable. And then the HOAs and all of that. And then you you break down. The, the things that got set up on top of that, um, which were very much inflected with, and, and this was very explicit, this was not accidental uh, exclusion, right? You, we want a public pool in a certain place. We want the, the roads to go to a th- certain place to keep, you know, protect the white kids um, from, from the other sort of undesirable elements. Zoning, all of that stuff. I mean, the, the, the Supreme Court considers a zoning uh, maps and they say, well, we, you know, we want to protect the white kids from, you know, these nuisance things that are like apartment buildings and low-income housing. So so that all is not critical race theory. It is just to say that it's hard to understand America. It's hard to understand law and the way things work without having an appropriate, accurate history of how race was used to create the society that we have. And it's not to say that anyone here should feel a certain way, but it should it should allow you to understand certain things so that you don't come up with some theory on your own. Um, and the th- because, because the theory you're going to grab onto is like, if you don't understand why are the, why is that the, are the black kids in that school, you know, getting, you know, have, have different outcomes. Um, I think it, it, the shortcut might be, well, it must be biological, genetic, it must be cultural. And um, I think it, it, it's, you know, uh, more nuanced and obviously that those are wrong. I think that there's a history here that you, sh- you can account for and um, would be more accurate kind of full picture. OK, does uh, and I guess you might as well say, since you referred to your own ethnicity, <laughs> that if people are curious, you're of Iranian descent, you're actually yep. born in Iran. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the the um, but but does, does uh, 
on that point you were making that uh, mm-hmm. CRT would tend to explain or at least have an explanation of uh, disparities in outcome uh, other than it being due to some shortcoming on the part of the people who wind up with less. Right. Is it, I mean, I mean, that part mm-hmm. you're, you're definitely saying, right. Um, yeah. Well, is, let me, let me put it this. I think CRT would say that race is not a lot. Race is a, a, a social construct. It's not real. Okay. And right. So the racial what, but what is that? But what does that mean? I mean, most people, you know, uh, uh, my job is to play devil's advocate and I can hear people mm-hmm. saying, wait a second. Some people have darker skin that mm-hmm. actually is in the genes. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, granted, there's a spectrum of darkness and there may be borderline cases and so on. Mm-hmm. But by and large, you can look at me and be pretty sure that, you know, you, you can kind of narrow down the part of the world where my ancestors going back 10 generations probably came from. So mm-hmm. at least probabilistically, you can say things like that. So what do you what do you mean when you say race isn't real? Right. So, well, I mean, of course, um, we all um, evolved in very different places. I mean, looking at like the ancient DNA, my, my people have been in the, yeah, Tiger Street Fairy, the, the Iranian steps for ever. I mean, you look at, I, you know, the genetic maps we left Africa and, and we are the people who stayed. <laughs> Everyone else left to go exploring the world. And, and my people from both sides of my family, according to the whatever, you know, genetics, we, we just never went anywhere. We just kind of stayed in that place. And so <laughs> I think that explains a lot of my own personality traits. I mean, I, you know, so, so of course there, there is that genetic legacy. Of course, you know, I was adapted for a certain whatever. Um, I think when you look at America, though, and you look at the legacy of slavery and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it is race becomes more of a construct when you look at the black white experience here, because, you know, it's, it, it, there was so much mixing and it, you know, things like the one drop rule and just the way that you presented, I mean, the way that, you know, these, you know, Irish immigrants and Italians, I mean, I think America creates like real radical mythologies based on, on these, these differences that don't exist in other countries. And I, I, you know, I, we have in, in Iran, in my country, like for sure colorism. I mean, my mom was light skinned and therefore just a much, much higher value. And my mm. father was from a dark skinned area. And so we have clear colorism. I mean, that, you know, you're, if you were green, you were ugly. And if you were l- lighter, you were pretty. So, you know, tons of skin bleaching and, and things like that, blonde, you know, hair, mm. um, nose jobs, all of that. And, and that is, of course, race, but it's, it's not, as um, uh, significant uh, as it is here. And, and I think that's what a lot of foreigners don't understand what is going on here with, with uh, the ways that Americans conceive of, of race. Um, and, and so I think when you look at the Black-White experience here, I mean, the fact that you had to make these like contracts and these Jim Crow codes and, and the very like specificity of these Black codes down South, it's almost like there was just, it was so close in, in togetherness that they had to make it like explicit that like, if you're black, if you have one, one drop of blackness, you can't touch this Bible and you, ha- you can't like go into this bathroom and you can't, you know, it, it, it was like this whole society built on white supremacy. And, you know, C. Van Woodward, the Southern historian is like the South, like corrupted itself because of this, because of Jim Crow, it, it, it like ruined Southern society mm. because they were so obsessed with this thing. And I think you follow that through and, and you see the way the suburbs were built here. I mean, race is just a, uh, a mythology in America that I think is just highly destructive to mm. uh, and, the society. In some parts of the South, there were these elaborate classifications. I think the word is octoroon. Have you ever heard that word? Yeah. It, it means yeah. someone who is one eighth black. Yeah. And it was like a yeah. thing. I mean, it was like you yeah. knew who the octoroons were in New Orleans at a certain point in history. Um, yeah. The... Uh, so, okay, so uh, but, let's see. But, but, yeah, but the, go ahead. I mean, the question you were saying about, like, you know, of course there are genetic differences, but, you know, I think, I, and I, re- I read so wildly, I, I hate read a lot of these, like, IQ books. And, and the thing that, that, you know, as a scientist that you know and, and others um, do also is that we actually don't 
we think we know more than we do about IQ. Like we, we, we tend to, I mean, we may know about race and evolution, but, but the way that some of this, like the IQ testing or the racial sort of intelligence stuff, it's like, it's, it's just an expression of hubris for us to say, well, we actually can like have data and, and numbers on intelligence and, and especially some of the legacy of these things. It's like, well, you can't talk about it, but we did, we had a whole, you know, era of, of science very much explicitly talking about these racial genetic differences. And, and the stuff was mostly all just crap. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I was reading, I'm, I've been reading like these insurance because for my uh, second book, got deep into the weeds of like the insurance sector. And there's all of this data and scientific things about how the black race was going extinct. And, you know, the starvation that they were suffering, the hair loss, all of that stuff was not a consequence of the conditions of their life it was a race trait it was a genetic thing you know and so when you see so much hubris and uh explanations of the the obvious thing that you can see as a person who lives in another time to say well like you're starving people and there's jim crow and they're in debt and and their hair's falling out and so you're like oh they're going extinct you know that's just such a dumb thing and sometimes i see arguments now and i'm like in you know hundred years, this is going to sound really, really stupid. Okay. Um, let me, uh, l- l- let me back up first of all and try to consolidate before we move forward to more kind of applications of the CRT idea, back up and, and try to kind of consolidate, uh, what we've, uh, what we've said so far. Let me just read a sentence from Wikipedia and see if you think, uh, this is, um, accurate. The the basic tenets of CRT include that racism and disparate racial outcomes are the result of complex, changing, and often subtle social and institutional dynamics uh, rather than explicit and intentional prejudices in individuals. So Mm -hmm. um, is that part of the, well, let me, let me, let me first say, is it, I was about to ask this question. So CRT is inclined to say, don't jump to the conclusion that disparate uh, outcomes reflect on the capabilities or determination or anything of the group that uh, achieves less in the way of income or education or whatever. Don't jump to that conclusion. Could we go further and say that CRT infers from disparity of outcome that there has been uh, discrimination, prejudice, bias? In other words, basically attributes everything short of equitable outcome to discrimination, to racism in some sense of the word. Yeah, you're, you're asking a question of causality. And I don't think, look, I mean, I think uh, w- w- what is the theory of, of causation that CRT espouses? And I would say, look, there isn't some panel of, of CRT people. I think people use CRT as a tool to critique the law, right? It's it, like literary theory. It's like, well, I think that Toni Morrison's, you know, stuff. So, so I can't, I, I won't, I can't speak to CRT. I can say this on causality is, um, you know, Occam's razor. Like, it's like, what, what uh, is it? Are disparate outcomes a legacy of a, a country that has had explicit racial hierarchies in its DNA, in its legal code for hundreds of years, Mm -hmm. um, or is it a happenstance of, uh, you know, genetic legacies and and, and race? And so looking at any disparity today, I would say that um, there is a history. I mean, like, you know, any look, dig like five layers deep on the tax system, the legal highway system, the park system. And at like two layers, you get to like, some explicit racist thing, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I I just think that it's not, uh, I think the deeper you go into any topic, you start seeing this stuff. I don't think you have to explain everything uh, as racism. I don't know that that's anything that a CRT person would say, but I think it is super important for um, uh, a a full concept of, of, history. And I think there's, I think it's worth examining the resistance to this, right? So why, why are people so, what is the thing that is angering? And so maybe that, that is something that's yeah. like, like what, well, uh, yeah, let me uh, throw some possibilities out there. And of course, part of it is that 
CRT is just now being deployed in partisan warfare, right? I mean, it's, you know, and we can maybe get into the question of like, when people say it's being taught in elementary schools or whatever, I mean, what is going on there? I mean, are many people teaching it under that rubric and or are they just calling attention to past discrimination and attributing some of current inequality to it or what? Uh, but um, I guess if you ask, why is there so much pushback? I can imagine uh, a couple of uh, things aside from, you know, being manipulated by Fox News and and Republicans Um one would be uh, people saying, um, well, OK, you're right. Jim Crow was a thing. But in terms of what I see, this would be a white person talking probably. But in terms of what I see on the books right now, what I see is affirmative action. What I see is my son or daughter is going to have a harder time getting into medical school than somebody who's not white and or a harder time. Uh, getting some job. And, and there are jobs like that. Now, you might well argue that, okay, but if you look at the broad sweep of, of jobs mm-hmm. handed out, you know, there is evidence, you know, the, the famous mm-hmm. test of sending sending out resumes and, and, and having kind of black sounding mm-hmm. names versus white sounding names. And the evidence mm-hmm. is that you send those out to employers and mm-hmm. indeed the white sounding names get more attention and uh, mm-hmm. even though the resumes are otherwise uh, identical and so on. Uh, I assume that would be a reply, but, but I still think if you're asking why, um, why do you get blowback? Well, I have, I have kids. I know how parents feel about kids. They're super important. And if you, if it becomes your perception that your kid is not getting a fair shake, what you consider a fair shake, that could be a source of some blow blowback. um, That's one thing. I have another thing I could throw at you, but why don't you handle that one? Yeah, I mean, so I guess let's go back to fairness, right? Um, I mean, when you go buy a house, um, let's start before the college application process, because that's a little bit late to start actually looking at fairness, right? When you go look at a, to buy a house, and I've done this several times, uh, you have, you know, uh, there are good schools and there are bad schools. And when you go, you know, and, and you say, well, you don't want to go to that school. Um, and, you know, my response is always, well, who who should, you know, your kids shouldn't, don't, you don't want to go send your kids to that school. It's like, well, whose kids should go to that school, right? Um, because somebody's kids are going to that school. And when you uh, um, tour that school and you see, you know, um, the, 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 the resources uh, differentials. And so you say, well, it's not fair, right? Then I would say, like at kindergarten, it's not fair that some kids have to go to that school and some kids get to go to this school or high school, um, uh, over police schools, under resourced schools. Some kids have to mm-hmm. walk to school fearing violence. Yeah. Um, some kids don't have trees or neighborhoods um, where they can go, or I'm sorry, uh, parks where they can go outside. Some kids mm-hmm. l- literally don't have access to green spaces. And that seems not fair. And the way that it's not fair, I think, is also heightened by it, you, you know, the determinations of race. Uh, more than likely, uh, the kids that are Black, are in redlined, formerly redlined, let's call it whatever, segregated communities that are under-resourced, that are over-policed, that don't have this access. And that seems to me also not fair. Um, And so, no, your son and you didn't do anything, but uh, fairness has to be a little bit uh, broader in scope than like just that college application process. It's also not fair that getting into a college is, is so, so weighty, right? Um, there's this, uh, Michael Sandel's new book about the tyranny of, of, of merit. Um, you know, it's like the, the difference between Harvard and not Harvard is like some people conceive of as like death or, you know, eternal life. It's like not that big of a deal, you know? Um, but it is, of course, because we have a very unfair society and one's zip code determines one's potential outcome. Um, and so one's, you know, if, if you if you can get into that track that leads to Harvard, like you want that. Mm-hmm. But I I also think it's it's sort of unfortunate because I think it's harming all of us that there, there is that, that track that is so far above this track. And for your kid to get off that track and go down, there's this real fear. Although I would assure parents in my position that there's not that far your kid's going to fall. Uh, if it's not Harvard, it's, you know, Berkeley or whatever, it's it's fine. They'll be fine. Um, mm-hmm. But there, there are kids who won't. And the, their mobility ladders are just gone. And that's not fair. Um, so, so I think, 
Um, fairness, uh, you know, I do, I, 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 I get it. I, I think there's a lot of um, uh, affirmative action has become, I mean, I write about it in my book. Uh, this is like a Nixonian program to cut down. So nobody lobbied for affirmative action. Nobody wanted that on the right. On the left, this was a Nixon strategy to like shut people up. Um, was it a was it an executive initiative during the Nixon administration? Yeah, it was executive, and it was first like quotas and voluntary. He asked like GE came out and like look, we we will voluntarily. I mean, this is like the, the height of the mixed economy, right? So we have tons of public investment in GE, and GE's like, yeah, we'll hire and train you know black employees, and it was you know. Uh, uh, a voluntary thing. And then the Nixon White House asked some companies to put in quotas. And that was like a non-starter. It was like dead on arrival. But then they were like, okay, well, we'll just do contracts, right? Contracts set aside from the federal government. And this was like, look, the two options in 1968 where George Romney was like trying to integrate in the Nixon White House. Nixon mm-hmm. sent George to Mexico in exile. The other side was, you know, a core initiative to put like World Bank type development funds into like a Marshall plan for the inner city having been left out. And Nixon's not about to do any of those things. I mean, his plan is black capitalism, which Hubert Humphrey says, look, you can't have black capitalism without capital, but that's exactly what that was. That's affirmative action, black capitalism without capital, just getting people to hire, um, doing, you know, like soft little things for black businesses. And then the courts um, really gutted that because the point of it was to fix the historic injustice. And in 1978, the Bakke decision in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said the only justification for affirmative action is for diversity in educational. So they already cut out all the other stuff, um, employment. Uh, so they in, effect, they, in effect, cut out the CRT part of the rationale in a way, right? I mean, yeah. it, we, yeah. are not, we are not redressing no. grievances from the past. We are not uh, yes. attacking the, the historical roots of the problem. Yeah. So it's like this big lie that universities have to do is like, well, we, you cannot use in the University of California system. We cannot. We have like bills in the legislature that have been passed. We can't consider race of any applicants. So we just have to like get around it. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And and we can't lie and we can't like count um, because the, the people got really angry about it. Right. So when we're looking at a candidate, you know, we're like, well, we should have a diverse array of candidates. But you can't like say the word you can't say race. And so we just like twist ourselves up. Um, there's a great, I mean, in the Baki dissent, um, Thurgood Marshall, he's like, how, how are you saying that we can't address historic wrongs? We, we haven't even gotten anywhere. And yet that's, that's affirmative action. So I, I'm, I don't think affirmative action is this like robust thing, but it has become a lightning rod. I think the same thing with CRT, like I mean, my kids go to the school district and the parents here are flipping out over CRT. And and here what happened was. What do they cite as examples? Where do they see it in the curriculum? Okay. Yeah. So uh, our, I, I live in Orange County, California, which which is a right kind of leaning um, district. And uh, at the high schools that my kids, well, one, what, my kid, one kid is at high school and I've got one middle school, one at elementary school. But um, there were several incidents at the high school, uh, some football players uh, saying the N word when a, a black team came by lots like rampant use of the N word that wasn't being um, uh, addressed. And then a couple of uh, uh, teachers, one was at the Capitol March. And anyway, so the students had this like see uh, the, the, the school district against racism and the school board responded with a cultural proficiency curriculum for teachers. That's all they call it, cultural proficiency. And you look at the stuff and it says basically like um, sensitivity training so that they're not um, saying, I mean, I, I can give examples, but uh, you know, my daughter's on the wrestling team and the coach, he's like an old guy and he, he, you know, there's one black girl on the team and he keeps making fun of her hair. And it's like- You mean it, like, you mean like, the fact like, that it is curly, just, like it's like, well, you know, sh- look at how much time she spends with it. I mean, it's just he's he's he thinks he's teasing, but she's yeah. the one. You know, one I, I think that happens more than people realize that there. Maybe I'm naive, but that people, uh, white people, sometimes yeah. naively think that if they make kind of jokes mm-hmm. related to race. Yes. That it's a way of showing it's an overture of sorts because it is a sign of true friendship that you yeah. kid each other about about things like that. Right. And and I think 
I, I, my, my, my daughter is giving me examples from college where she's sure the girl is just a racist. And I'm like, it may seem crazy that a white girl thinks making a joke about picking cotton to a black girl was an incredibly clumsy attempt to say, I acknowledge our difference, but, you know, but I, I think that happens. I really think so, it happens. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So here, I mean, the, the coach is, you know, a 70 year old guy and the girl is, you know, 14. And so she, she took it in, in good faith and she was she's just lovely and I'm sitting there just like cringing but that's the kind of thing where I think a cultural competency was supposed to be like um look generally uh don't say things like this because it might offend people because you could I mean getting being the only black girl in on a team and constantly having it be about your hair can it, do, it does something to the psyche and I can tell you this as as, as uh, someone who grew up here it's, it was just it it can be hard. And so I, you learn to live with it, but, you know, and you know, being called whatever terrorist or whatever, and, and you, you kind of adapt and you realize that, and you, you are very actually oh, like um, generous. I, I rarely ever felt like something was like in bad faith. However, wouldn't it have been nice if people were like, Oh, don't, that, maybe that's making her feel like otherized. Mm. Or wouldn't it be nice if people had not called you a terrorist? Yeah, that would, it would have been, been nice. nice. It would have now, been let nice me ask like, you something. Let me ask you something. Did that actually happen? Like, and they meant it as a time. joke about your Iranian heritage? All the time. Well, for me, yeah, it was a terrorist. Even though, actually, by the way, there aren't many terrorist acts involved. Well, but yes, I, grew before, I grew up before 9-11. And I, I feel like, you know, because of the hostage crisis, um, we were oh, okay. very yeah. much, yeah. 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 And then there was like the Apu from the Simpsons. So everyone was like, your dad's Apu from the Simpsons. He owns a gas station. And we were like, I was like, I wish. <laughs> um, but, you know, just, you know, not without my daughter, all of the stuff that was just like in the cultural soup that was really quite offensive, you know, not without my daughter made it seem like Iranians didn't bathe and ate like rice with flies on it. And I felt like it was just stuff that, but my point is that the, all, the, the school district just did a cultural competency and, and they hadn't even started it yet when the parents started like protesting and calling it CRT and the CRT didn't come from the school. It's not a left-wing school. It is a very right-wing school board. I mean, we had a school board uh, uh, member run on like a Trump ticket, you know? And so this is not, this was not from some progressive wing at all. Um, And yet the parent, there was like this uprising. And I think part of it, this, this is a symptom of like, everything is national politics now. Like this was a very local issue, like a local incident being addressed by local officials at, you know, locally, right through their own teachers. And the teachers all wanted to do it, especially the younger ones, because they felt like they were, you know, trying to like educate colleagues on some of this stuff. And, uh, and the parents, I think were just clearly like not reading the materials, not using context and kind of going on their CRT, like whatever they heard from Fox News. Um, So I I guess for me, it's just, it it becomes, um, I know, you know, like there was an example of like Dalton, um, that 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 was a big that got a lot of attention. Right, so that's the, that's the, yeah. this uh, elite school in New York, uh, yes. and what and some some parent I guess pulled his child from Dalton and wrote a long thing about what they were doing. And I got to say, he he made it sound you know I I don't know what the truth was, but he did. Uh, I just recall thinking, yeah, well maybe they're going too far. I don't know. I forget I forget the details, but yeah, maybe you remember more than I do but, about but the I Dalton think, case. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Dawson case was that they did have like an explicit uh, racial instructions. Maybe it was like, uh, I think to a non-progressive, um, like like a college progressive person, the, the, the words in there were just like way to the, uh, they were meant for an audience that was not everybody, right? But the thing that Dalton sells, I mean, you're, pay- you're paying 50 something thousand dollars a year for your kid. And, and the thing that Dalton parents are buying is that cultural competency, right? Mm-hmm. They want most of them, except for this guy, want their kid to go to get to college knowing all of the signals and signs right. of the poli- privileged and elite. And so this has become the way to you, you know, some of these words and the way that you that they're used now is very much a college level thing. And and I actually have, I'm frustrated. I, I like had to quit the associate dean for diversity and inclusion part because I felt like so much of it of that was um, uh, policing 
you know, uh, I guess I should say it was a very punitive. So uh, um, the students were very punitive in the things that they wanted. Um, and I, uh, you know, so, uh, um, you know, maybe a, like someone who um, screwed up like a lower uh, ranked person, like a secretary did something offensive and people were demanding like that, that she be fired. And um, I, I felt like this was, that this is not the point, right? So I got into, I actually got asked to do it, right? This is not a job that it's like, you know, associate dean, you, you just kind of get asked to, it's like a volunteer thing, right? And I wanted to um, increase our, um, you know, admissions of, of black students. I wanted to, you know, faculty and, and, and uh, that kind of stuff. And it ended up being a lot of just like managing student complaints. And that's not what I, why I got into this. So but are you not, are you course, not still doing that job or is that? Not, not next year. No, no, no. You're not I, doing I'm, it next year. I'm okay. still, yeah, I'm still a professor, got tons of committee work, but I don't do that job. Okay. Um, and, but, but I will say that it's a very different thing. And I think there is a sense of, of um, a punitive, and I would say like neoliberal, like um, uh, individual punishment kind of thing that, that the, the younger generations have that I think is a, is a mismatch with, with my sensibilities, right? It's um, if someone does something wrong, they should be fired. And, you know, you're like, well, how are they going to support their family? You know, or what, you know, right. and, and it's, it's, um, it's exactly what you said is like, they're like unintended things that people are doing that maybe they just don't know all the right words and, and, and culture changes so fast. But the Dalton story, I think is an example of like, look, if you want to maintain that prestige and elite uh, privilege, you do have to be up on the words. And so that parent misunderstood the Dalton mission, right? Mm-hmm. The Dalton mission is not it's not like a better education. It's a different education. You're preparing kids for Harvard and Yale. And that's the cultural currency at Harvard but, and Yale. But is one way of saying what you're saying that, look, at Dalton, they, their job is to teach these kids the language of the elite that they are going to graduate into. And the language of the elite is wokeism. Is that one way to put it? Um, it is the language of the elite. Yes. And not, but not the practice. Uh, the, 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 the elite has to justify okay. its privileges. Right. right? Um, that, and that's the whole point is like, how do you keep your privileges as you, you have to like adapt. And uh, I would rather, yeah, I would rather um, Harvard talk however they want, but open up admissions to poor kids. Right. Well, this, <laughs> this raises a question. I was, uh, Going to ask when you back when you were talking about, you know, people shopping for real estate saying, I want my kid to go to the good school, not the bad school. There are good schools and bad schools. And and I've always thought, uh, I mean, in terms of resources available, prevailing culture, you know, quality of teachers and everything. I've always thought that that is, uh, you know, well, it flows partly out of this system of financing that's so dependent on uh, local property taxes. And I've always thought that if you're going to get serious about addressing uh, disparities and racial outcomes, that's one thing you should get serious about is changing uh, the, the, the funding of the of schools and so on. And this is a roundabout way of, of getting to kind of my George Floyd question. After the George Floyd thing, when I looked at the kinds of things, uh, some of the reforms, quote, that were coming out of it, like we're going to start capitalizing the word black. And and, you know, you knew you were going to see like probably MSNBC was going to hire, you know, with a number of black hosts was going to go from X percent to X plus one percent. You know, you were going to see some reshuffling of conspicuous elites, probably. Right. And <laughs> things like that that didn't seem to me to be to get at things as fundamental as how education is funded and i and 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 the way the way i kind of put it i wrote a piece about it is um you know obviously the cop who did this to george floyd should be punished um but a, a question we should another goal it seems to me should be to reduce the number of black kids to grow up to where george floyd found himself which is yeah. that he did hand a counterfeit bill to some guy and he 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 was on drugs and this led to an encounter with cops. That's just bad to begin with. Even if the cops handle it well, there's something wrong with your society if a hugely disproportionate number of blacks are winding up in situations like that. And my own concern about wokeism 
is partly that it's just dealing with a lot of not only, but in part with a lot of superficial solutions that actually just, you know, detract from focus on some of the more, uh, I guess you might say material or fundamental interventions. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah and I guess the, the question then is, well, what, what are the material conditions? How, how do you change the material conditions? And I would say, um, this is where, you know, you talked about capitalizing blacks or using certain language. You know, I think you look at the way that, you know, George, where, where George Floyd was murdered was a, you know, formerly redlined area that is, you know, it's a banking desert, a food desert. It has all of the legacy of, of racism. It's over-policed. It is under-policed in some ways, over-policed in other ways. Um, the schools are underfunded. There's no path towards wealth ownership or home ownership in, in certain areas. And it's also, you know, like, uh, a site of um, sort of overwhelming, you know, traumas associated with property. Okay, so how do you change that? Right. You, what, what one way to do it is to um, going back to the '60s era. You can um, integrate. You can build up capital. Each of those, I think, going back to one of your earlier works, the, the non-zero was what was the book called? Zero sum versus not zero sum. It was, it was called non-zero. Non-zero. That's what I thought. Okay. So um, you know, society, civilization. When when Something becomes, uh, and I'm restating it. Something becomes non-zero sum. You, you you kind of extend the borders of you know who we're benefiting, and I think that that the that's better, right? That we have less war and less violence. And I think looking at the system that we have, you've got the white suburbs and you've got the black ghettos, and it's very zero sum. If you if you take the kids from one and shuffle them around the white parents are going to feel a loss the more black kids that are sh- shuttled into their neighborhood they mm-hmm. feel lost their kids i mean it's just that this is like a political third rail you would never take those white kids and shuttle them into a black neighborhood right that was like a dead non-starter but essentially if you want to do fair you have to spread resources even tax resources right why should my property taxes go to these people who you know are Blah 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 blah. Fill in the racist details. So so don't, but that but then if if you're considering it as zero sum, that's a loss to you. So ask the parents of Dalton: Would you rather capitalize the word black and learn wokeism, or would you rather um, do equitable school distribution? Not mm-hmm. not have private schools skimming off the top and and put everyone on the same basis of education, of access, of mobility. Let the kids, you know. Uh, be on an even playing field. Everyone knows. We all know that our kids are not on an even playing field. We just we know that. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of our some of us um, have are, we're starting our kids way way ahead. And so we can either give up that privilege, or we can learn wokeism and and have the elite be woke. And so I think you're right that it's not dealing with the main thing, but the main thing is going to require something of us. If you want to see hysteria, progressive hysteria, try to integrate uh, a school and, and talk to the white parents that show up at those meetings. I mean, those are liberal white parents. There are um, conservative white parents. My whole county, Orange County, was created to escape L.A. Uh, once integration happened. I used to live in Athens, Georgia. And you look at Athens, Georgia, and the way that the county schools developed, like, 1968. Every private school was, like, established 1968. Why? why? Right? I mean, mm-hmm. it was... It, it is it is so obvious when you look at those um, places and, and, you know, even now when you try to do a little bit of resource shifting, uh, parents freak out. And I think those are the fights that we need to fight as far as like Black Lives Matters demands. I think, I, you know, I think that was a real grassroots thing. I mean, from what I understand, there was not a coordinated approach. Um, I thought it was a. Uh, it, it varied across the different places. We had our own in our, you know, uh, school district here, some of the students um, asking for certain things that were well below, you know, um, what I thought that they, they should have been able to have already. Um, so I, I just think, um, you know, it's like, what hill do you want to die on? Is it CRT or is it the fact that um, some, you know, like black kindergartners have to go, you know, through a school system that has no mobility out. And, and why should they, why, why do, why do they deserve that? You know, and you can go back to like primordial sin and their parents and all this stuff, but like, these are kids, right? And I think uh, the way, if we can non-zero um, our, our view of children, like it's not my kids and those kids, it's 
all of our kids. You know, related to that, I think, is the question of uh, I mean, I don't want to get too much into the politics of this, but and the political strategy of this. But uh, the question of whether to make uh, policies, you know, as a formal matter, Mm -hmm. race based or class based. It seems like that you can imagine policies that would help a lot of uh, improve a lot of public schools that black kids are going to. That would also improve public schools that low income white kids are going to and that would have uh, an easier time politically and would create a non zero sum dynamic between some white voters and some black voters. And I would think, uh, you know, if these policies were favored by Democrats would be found threatening by the Trumpist wing of the Republican Party precisely because uh, these they would improve the lot of some uh, working class white voters. Would be appealing, you're saying, or would not be appealing? Would be appealing. I'm talking well, about, a, 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 you know, an income base, just just say yes. like schools mm-hmm. and areas with the per capita income of below X, mm-hmm. get Y, is a different kind of sounding policy than mm-hmm. schools with a X percentage of black kids get Y. And yet it, it winds up helping a lot of black kids and probably uh, politically uh is a, a a smarter thing for democrats to do i don't know <laughs> absolutely every i mean i think why why not just put all the taxes in a bigger pot either statewide or nationally and then spread evenly like that that seems to me like eminently fair right on any level like state you know and yet we do it like like we want to make the closest little circle of where property taxes go into the school district. And of course you want to have local autonomy, but you can still have local autonomy. It's just that the money that you use to fund your school um, can come from a national pot. And I agree. I think that these things would be popular um, except for where school districts lose. It happened to be the most politically powerful. And yes, I think you, you have, you um, at one point in the country, and this is what my next book is addressing actually is in part, um, Welfare, you know, welfare politics became anathema because it got linked with race. It was the moochers and, and the way that the white working class kind of is suffering now from the like self-imposed punishment of um, cutting all of those public resources um, in a very skillful political maneuver to cut off, you know, um, white from black you know, people that were going through the same types of, you know, uh, harms that that when you know jobs were offshore and all of that. So absolutely, mm-hmm. class politics is an answer. It's just um, we, we have a system that doesn't really support that easily. But but we could, I mean, certainly try it. OK, let me let me ask you one more question about the nature of the blowback that CRT gets. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one thing that has happened over the last couple of decades is. Terms like racism and white supremacism, it seems to me, have been redefined. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when I was growing up, white supremacist was somebody with a a hood, Mm -hmm. you know, a white hood. It was like it was like somebody with an explicit, Mm -hmm. an explicitly racist ideology. And racism was thought of as 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 a as a as a conscious attitude, kind of like a racist was someone who was uh consciously and even explicitly biased and held certain kinds of views about black people and so on. And I think both of those terms are now being used much more broadly in a way that I I think is consistent with the spirit of CRT. The the racism refers to uh, kind of uh, biases that are embedded in a system and may not be uh, the result of of conscious intent on a day-to-day basis. And it seems to me that one thing that happens is, you know, because the, the the former meaning of racist is is more offensive if it's applied to you, right? Like if somebody called you a racist of the old type, that's more offensive than than them saying, "Well, you're part of a system that's implicitly but consequentially biased." Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there's a certain amount of just uh, miscommunication here. I, I absolutely agree. I think the the intent. You know, when I wrote my book, Color of Money, I tried to take out like uh, any racist intent just to show how the system of money and, and the economy works. And I think one of the things that happened sometime in the Obama administration, I think, I think there was this hope, for lack of a better term, of the Obama administration that 
it was like the realization of a colorblind sort of dream. Like we were over this long legacy of, of, of racial divisions and things like that. And, and it was clear, you know, you could see it in the tea party, you could see it in some of that, you know, Muslim Kenyan birth certificate stuff. Um, I think it started, you know, a little bit before that as well. I mean, in the sort of um, post nine 11 uh, environment. And I think once Trump is elected, I think it just like blew the cover on that. You know, I think it was, you know what, we we weren't supposed racist. We were not sort of post color, we weren't colorblind. It was always there. And this is something, and I, I don't think it's quite as catastrophic. I think there's a bunch of kids who haven't had that like we did, like the hope for something different. But if you look through American history, I mean the strains have been tied together. I mean, you see, you know, Jackson and then FDR and Wilson and and so I think the two strains have always been together. And I think Trump really brought that up. And so I think there is a generation of kids and, and you don't blame them who this is this is their view of politics. And and I think it's accurate to say that Trump was racist. He, he was a, he was a white supremacist. I mean, he ran on a wall, a Muslim oh. ban. It was impossible to see that not race baiting. I understand that some of the other things he said appeal to a certain group of people who were not racist but and and i don't know what is in trump's heart i don't care but he um used those the he weaponized a a thing in the culture and i think um you would expect a response um from 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 kids who not kids younger the younger generation who um did maybe didn't didn't understand like why why are these people you know um uh, voting yeah. for this person. No, I don't think there's any doubt from my point of view that when you, you know, talk about Latin Americans and, 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 and call them, you know, rapists and so on, and then throw in, and there are some good people too. I mean, it seems to me there's, there's no doubt that you're weaponizing race and, uh, and, and trying to capitalize on bias that may exist and maybe worst of all, making it worse. Um, okay. but, uh, the, um, so let me uh i mean we're 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 getting near the end of our time L- let me uh ask just just a couple of quick things i mean i mean one is just to make sure i understand your local school situation the it sounds like what they did was uh the idea was the initiative was to get teachers and administrators together and it was a kind of a sensitivity training or something a way of saying like look if you you know, if you use this term, Mm -hmm. this group of kids may react this way. And it's like, Mm -hmm. why not just, you know, it's easier on everybody if you don't use that term. And if you're aware that they may um, Mm -hmm. react that way, I gather that's the kind of thing it was. And then was it explicitly called uh, critical race theory? Was that part of the? No, no mention. I I mean, right. So it didn't call itself CRT, but I mean, in the blowback, was it called by its critics CRT? In in the critics called it CRT. Okay, Um, they did. It was developed, it was developed like two, two, two years ago before this thing was a thing, but it was announced and they said this is CRT, but they called it cultural proficiency training. Yeah, yeah. Not even race. It was culture like they were talking about gender and 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 uh, sexuality and like immigrant populations it was a whole just sensitivity training is exactly the right the right terminology basic yeah it's funny because you know you remember the yale incident right yes the Mm -hmm. the and that started with i guess a dean sending out a memo and one of the things it said was okay it's halloween Mm -hmm. be mindful that like if you dress up as a Native American, you know, your costume is an ethnicity, kind of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Native Americans may be offended by that. I didn't, you know, and I'm not like a super woke person by any means. And, and I do think that in some cases, mm-hmm. people have definitely gone needlessly far in kind of trying to, you know, make us exercise care and what we say and so on. But it seemed to me that, like, when you've got every year a bunch of freshmen coming from all over the world, including... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, from, you know, middle America, including whites of low income from middle America, you, you know, a huge variety of cultural backgrounds. There may well be people to whom it's never occurred that a, a costume like that is offensive to somebody. I, I didn't think it was all that egregious 
to point it out. But 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 I guess I, I wonder if part of the blowback sometimes, and I don't think it was so much in this case, but part of the blowback sometimes is the inference that what you're saying is the kid who was going to dress up that way is a racist. And, and, and it seems to me that CRT in a way kind of nourishes that interpretation by virtue of defining racism in this new way as something that's not conscious. Is this making sense at all? I'm just, this this theory is just coming to mind. I think, um, uh, CRT would define racism as a race, race, um, yes, it's something like it's, it's embedded in laws and systems and you don't actually need individual races. So I actually think it's a misunderstanding to say that you are racist because of your part of the system. I think we are all implicated in the system that we live in. It's impossible to not be just by sheer nature of living in it. It doesn't make us all racist, but we could say that the system of whatever housing that we have like its original thing was racist, it, explicitly so. And to recognize that doesn't make each individual racist, right? Um, the things that happen at Yale don't actually affect my life. I've never been to Yale. I visited the campus. I didn't get in. I didn't, you know, I didn't apply. I was not, but, you know, and, and I think most people don't go to Yale, don't have friends at Yale, you know? And I think the, the, the way I see or Middlebury or Harvard, and you see these things that happen among a very specific elite and the existence of that elite and, and their judgment of regular people who are not elite bothers people, as it should, because I think you don't want to be less than, you don't want to be considered like a dumb yokel by some Middlebury college student. But I think there's like this personalization that happens when there's like some, you know, student, you know, they call whatever mob, like some students sh- shout down Charles Murray and don't let him talk. And like, someone in like Oklahoma is like enraged by that, right? Or Oklahoma, I just random. Um, but like, you know, I mean, things happen all the time in all sorts of places where that, that's not those, that th- this is not a, a thing that affects us. And so I think the question is like, what, what are those things that enrage you? And asking why, like the, I can't watch those videos of, of the, I, 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 I couldn't watch to the end of the George Floyd video because it's so, um, I'm sure you you have the same experience. I think Trump had the same experience watching that video. And I think um, scenes of uh, violence on Black people really hurt. Um, I I get like that when I think about Palestine, right? Um, There's certain things in the Middle East when I hear about um, bombs in Iraq, when I hear, see the images, I, um, it, it hurts me on a personal, visceral level. And it, when I see, Charles Murray shouted down, I don't. That that had no identification with him, right? And so mm. that's that's a me thing, right? Um, I, I'm not bothered at all by these shouting mobs. It's never once triggered an emotional reaction. Well, anything. do you consider that is that a shortcoming good. on your is that a shortcoming on your part? Well, yeah, I mean it's not an identity that is clearly like part of my like lizard brain or my uh, it, you know, it's not like a subconscious yeah. identity that I hold. I'm not like a white man, I have been called out by students for sure. And, and, and at talks, I, I talk a lot about race. And I've been called out a lot in places where I'm like, come on, you know, like I'm doing this whole thing on racism and someone's like, you use this term and that's, you know, whatever. And and like out of the whole thing, that's what you got. And so it, it doesn't feel good. It really doesn't. It doesn't feel good to be called out and called. You mean you know, you've been whatever. called out as a, as a racist? I haven't been called a racist, but I've been called out on terms that I've used that were not the right terms. And I've been told that that's not right. I've been, yeah. And, and in hurtful ways, I, I don't think I've ever been. So you've been, you've been, a, yeah, I mean, uh, you've been, a, you, you, you've, you've taken it from the woke side for not being woke enough. I mean, you oh, don't have to buy into that terminology, but that's yes, what yes. we're talking about. I, from the left, from people who knew more, and you know, and, and, and I think you can choose, you can say, well, do I want to change that word? Is they, are they right? And, and sometimes I have, I've changed, but you're right. You know, I shouldn't, I didn't capitalize the word black in my book. Um, it wasn't Harvard standard. I didn't. And, and I've heard since from a lot of people that, the, that that I should have. And I think the next time I will, you know, and I think um, enslavement, I said slavery in the book and I've been called out a lot. And I'm not sure I'm still on the fence about that one because I don't know what, like, do we call it what they called it or do we call it what is anyway. But um, I, again, I think uh, it, it doesn't 
hurt me viscerally because it's uh, not um, something I hold dear is, is my, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong on, on these things. And I feel generally committed to the cause that I feel like I can stand some calling out to just like get it right. I think some of it is overboard, of course. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. just, you know, you're missing the point. But um, uh, yeah, so, so I think it, it is, it does, you know, um, the fact that so many people are upset about CRT where actually if you ask your kids in, in elementary school and, and you know, it, it is understandable because you, when you get the kids young and you teach them this history, it's, they're, they're just better at absorbing it and they can build this identity. And you have a bunch of people who have built their identity on some story of American exceptionalism or um, progress, always America being better. And it is, it's a real identity hit to hear your country that you love be called racist. And I think um, that's hard, you know, and I, I think uh, I would rather not do that. I would not rather not do it that way, but to say, here's the historical fact. Um, and, and it just happened this way uh, because I think the alternative is then you're just creating a fantasy of uh, uh, a country. And then the gaps in your historical knowledge are then you're, you're filling up with a fantasy. And, and I think that that's problematic. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, Greg Grandin's book, I don't know if you read the end of the myth. Uh, he talks about the frontier and um, he, he's a great, great scholar that you, I think would appreciate, but he talks about, you know, the, the way that manifest destiny and, and foreign war, it was all about this like myth of endless progress. And America was just like endlessly expansive. And then you get to the end, like, there's no more border. There's no, there's no more land to occupy. And, and he, he talks about the Trump era as like that aggression turning inward and kind of mm-hmm. ripping apart the inside. And, and it did feel like there was like this pressure valve at, you know, being able to expand West and go overseas and all this stuff. And all of a sudden it stops. And, and I think we are in a real crisis and I think it behooves us to, to get our stuff right. And I, and, and from another perspective, look, I'm from, a people whose best days were well behind us. We were, we have been a people in decline for well, a long time. You never know. The, the, the night is young. Uh, but, but it's not, a, it's not something that you go around Iranian saying like, Oh, well, we're just, we're always getting better. We're the, right. the future is going to be better than the past. We don't think that after 1978, it, there was a sense that like, Oh, you actually can lose ground. You lose progress. Um, you can devolve in your evolution. And I, and I think it's helpful. It's a helpful context for Americans to have um, because I think we put too much stock in our institutions always becoming better and being able to withstand stuff. And they're not. They're, they're very vulnerable. Okay. Uh, so I guess that's um, – I'm trying to think if there's anything uh, we, we need to mm-hmm. – touch on one more time or anything. I mean, I just, I guess quickly I'd say on the point of, on the vocabulary point, Mm -hmm. should I say enslavement rather than slavery? I do think it would be good for, for people on that part of the left to ask uh, just whether it's worth, whether the gain is worth the amount of antagonism generated and, 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 you know, like uh, slavery and enslavement. I mean, I guess I see the semantic difference. Enslavement more emphasizes that this was an act perpetrated by oppressors, by people. I, I get that. But it's not as if, like, the problem is a ton of people in America, I don't think, walking around with having associating positive connotations with the word slavery, right? I mean, it's like, right, right. it's mm-hmm. thought of as this very bad thing. And mm-hmm. I, that was done by people. I, I guess I would just, uh, again, I see the semantic difference. And I, and I yeah. uh, uh, but, you know, as like an older person, I would just say <laughs> it, it, it genuinely at some point in your life becomes challenging mm-hmm. to adapt Absolutely. your language to every new demand. It's like just mm-hmm. really hard, you know, yes. and, and yes. and you're especially when it's like like you know you read one day uh latinx and then you see a poll saying uh 95% of latinos if i can use yeah. that word yeah. don't want to be called that or have never yeah. even heard the term you know and yes, yes, it, yes. it's just it's just like how much are you gaining mm-hmm. 
by getting us, you know, I, I yeah. hope you're, I hope, the, I hope victory feels sweet because I, I think you're paying a big political price. Right. But this, and this is the thing, I think it's not a coordinated thing, but it is a language of elite in educational structures like Yale or Harvard that then get like um, the escape their the bounds of where of their use and they they come into the culture and 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 that's that's the problem here it's like CRT was an academic theory and it like escaped into the public consciousness and, and you need to know a lot before you get to CRT about legal theory and about interpretation and and the same with like these very minor academic debates about you know, enslavement or, or trans or whatever. And, and then they just get mainstreamed. And, you know, yeah, like some things belong in certain, I mean, it's like the way that everyone's an epidemiologist now and knows all about like, you know, just it's, it's one thing to like be a well-informed person, but it's another thing to like have, you know, watch a YouTube video that is like debunking vaccines because you, you heard like three words in there that, that you think you understand. Um, so, so I think I'm not bothered by like in the academy when I'm writing a paper, to use the terminology as I'm talking to other academics. Um, and I think sometimes the, the, uh, the, those words get weaponized um, in, in the wrong way, but I don't think it's a coherent like party doing it. Um, I, I just think it's over anxious, uh, you know, young people. And, and that's fine. I, I mean, I'm just not bothered by it, I guess. We, we but, were but once right. all... I, I, yeah. I have a hard time keeping up. I really do. I mean, um, they them was really hard for me. Like I, you know, like ESL. Yeah. I never had. We never had a plurals in Farsi. Um, huh. I had to watch my. I had to watch my kids explain to my parents who are barely understanding plurals in English after having lived here. You know, they still. <laughs> and my kids were, and I was just sitting back, just like laughing because it was like, and my parents were like, okay, well, we want to understand this. Like they weren't opposed. They're very like adaptable and open minded. But they just like were like I, I, I don't know if I can do that, you know. And, yeah. and, my, and my kid, you know. So, um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And the, the, uh, that. there's one thing I like about they them is there is there are these times in writing where you don't know the gender mm-hmm. of the person you're referring to. You're speaking, and and, and it, you know, fifty mm-hmm. years ago they would just say he him. Right. You know, uh, uh, the way they would, you know, the way they would say, well, men have always when they met yes. people, but they would just say men, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, it got to where and this was a reasonable reform, I think you had to say he or her. I, I mean, he or she and him or her when you didn't know the gender and they or them is 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 easier. I, I applaud that. Yes. <laughs> me they got me. me <laughs> yes. I mean, in, in that particular usage, it's going to save me time yeah. and so i, I i'm kind of okay to buy into, into that yeah, one. yeah. Um, i mean far, yeah farsi has no gender and i prefer that i you know you used to call a person a thing and you know it, it doesn't have to be we don't have to resist we can just say oh okay that's i can do that yeah. you can do they yeah. i mean we can all do that it's yeah fine. i can probably i can probably i can probably do that <laughs> uh, but but i'm not sure i can, uh, all, I can do all of them there's a lot of no. them and yeah, they keep yeah, changing yes and it should be okay for you to to not know all of it. Um, yeah. I think where we get into trouble where it's like, I refuse to do it because I'm just angry about it. You know, and sometimes it's, it's not worth the fight. Well, I would say that to both <laughs> sides. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> yes, like yes, inevitably right. a certain number of people are going to say, yeah. I mean, remember uh, people all have their battles and, yes. uh, and people of all races can tell you, how life has been hard in some important respect. Some of them have had huge yeah. tragedies and uh, they're uh, you're only going to get so far demanding that they pay particular attention to a, a particular group. Uh, but I, I will I'll keep. Yeah. I'll yeah. Keep no, but you know, there's the other side of this is like the way that I grew up, you know, wall street pre the me too era where people are like some some of the partners are like this. So avoid mm-hmm. those part, you know, and, and it was part of just like being a woman in a male dominated space. You just, you, you didn't say things because this is just the world, the way the world is. And I was really nervous early in the me too debate. I'm like, what are these, what are they doing? Like I was scared. I was scared for them. And for the I women who like, were the women who were speaking out. Yes. I, I uh-huh. was very, and, and, and some of them were sharing documents and in groups that I was in and I didn't say anything. To, I was like, you know, knew about all of this stuff. I was in firms where this was happening, still is happening. And 
Um, but but the, the, it was a younger generation. This was not like we couldn't do it. It was like millennials or Gen Z who were like, I'm calling, I'm calling this person out. And that's, it, it's not something that my generation did. And I just feel like we're better. I mean, were there excesses? I'm sure. But like, if I could go back, I mean, and get the like courage to have been able to do that. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of women were driven out of the industry completely. I mean, it, it was it was rough. And so a lot of talent lost. And I think, I don't know. So sometimes you've got to break, what do they call it? Break eggs, yeah. use sharp elbows. And so I I tend to not do like the kids these days because sometimes, the, so, sometimes I do, like I feel like you're missing the point. I don't like this, but I think some of, some of the consciousness of the, the younger generations is inspiring to me as an older yeah. person. Well, I think Me Too is a case where the rules had to be rewritten. And, you know, you could say it's kind of unfair that guys who grew up with one set of rules wind up being punished. But it's not that huge a price to pay. And you kind of when the rules change, it's in the interest of everyone to make it clear. And and it's like, you know, that's bad news for Andrew Cuomo. But it's not like all of this was done before it was obvious to everyone that the rules had changed. So I mean, Andrew Cole, not a- he's, been a, he's been a jerk forever. Like, you know, he, <laughs> he knew he was wielding power, forget the me too stuff, you know, like, so I, so I don't think that you catch, sometimes you catch these guys who are otherwise just really good people and messed up ones, but yeah. usually it's a pattern of behavior. And, you know, I think Trump, getting away with so much like blew that can open for yeah. so many women. I, I think that anger, like it's still being reckoned with. Uh, I felt it. I felt rage um, and, you know, still kind of ongoing. Not at every man I'm married. I love, you know, my father. I'm no problems with men in general, but, but the way that, that he Trump and some of his people were able to just like be explicit about it was really hard to take, you know, um, as someone who thought that we were getting to a better place. Yes, Trump was in certain <laughs> respects hard to take. We can close on, yeah. on a, a, certainly on a note of agreement. Um, well, well, thank you, Marissa. And thank where you. can uh, people reach you? Like, what's your Twitter handle, for example? Just my first, first and last name uh, at Marissa Baradaran. M e h r s a b a r a d a r a n. Okay, and I am at Robert Ryder, and uh, this is the Right Show. Thanks for watching. Feel free to rate. Uh, and review, and uh, I think I'll again mention the name of your two books: uh, "How the Other Half Thanks" and "The Color of Money." And it sounds like you're uh, you're working on a third one. Yep, and about neo neoliberalism, law, and economics. Okay, maybe, well, good. Yeah, maybe I've, I've, in there. <laughs> I've, I've heard. Yeah, I can imagine <laughs> yeah. it having a place. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks so much. So much. Thank you.